We've all got old phones and tablets lying around in our drawers. But what if we could turn these useless bits of equipment into a full retro gaming handheld? Let me show you how. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. If you're anything like me, um, you never throw away your old phones and tablets. So you probably have a number of these lying around in a desk somewhere, just gathering dusk and, well, basically doing nothing. But these are actually quite powerful little handheld devices. So what we can do is we can very easily turn one of these into one of these which is a handheld retro gaming device. So let me show you just how easy it is to get this up and running. So even though these are older mobile devices, when compared to our sort of project um, devices such as Raspberry Pis and so on, they are actually quite powerful. So this is my old Moto G4 from a couple of years ago, and that has an octa-core ARM Cortex processor with up to 1.5 gigahertz. Um, so again, quite a lot of processing power there and even this one here which is the one we're going to be using in this project is my old Tesco um, Huddle 2 tablet from 2014 uh, but even that has got a quad core atom processor running at 1.8 gigahertz so as I say we, we've got some quite powerful devices here and when you consider then that we have full HD screen we've got high quality speakers and, and sound built into these devices um, touch screen panel uh, and on all that goes with that um, we actually have got a very good basis then for a little handheld gaming device. So getting these up and running then we only have to put a few bits of software in there. If we want to we, we can run it using the touch screen but of course we can then start buying some of these sort of um, clip-on tablet or, or phone uh, game controllers uh, but they come in this one here um, I bought that so, so it was big enough to actually fit my tablet but even that only came in at about £25 or about $25 so we're not talking masses of expense here all the software, of course, is free. All the games, well, of course, we're going to get those um, online and, and that's up to you to sort of work out um, how you get hold of those. But all of that, and essentially then, gives us a lovely package where we can just reuse and recycle one of these old machines and turn them into something really fun to play with. So let me show you just how we get that all set up and how easy it is to get up and running. But before we make a start on that, it's worth having a look at the performance we're going to get out of these old devices. So pretty much anything you have in your drawer is going to cope with 8-bit games consoles. So the NES, the Sega Master System and the 8-bit computers, um, that, that's a definite it will work. On top of that then, so 16-bit systems such as your Mega Drives, your PS1s and your um, Super Nintendo. Again, pretty much everything will run that. Um, it would have to be a very low-powered device not to be able to cope with those. Similarly, arcade titles are pretty much all going to play. Some of the later 3D arcade titles, um, you may struggle with those depending on your system, but pretty much all arcade is going to be um, fine for you. Beyond that though then, um, it really depends of course on what you have in there. So this Tesco Huddle, it's a quad core uh, 1.8 gigahertz Atom processor, it's 10 years old. Uh, it was considered low power at the time, but a Nintendo 64 is absolutely no problem to it. Uh, as you can see here we're running GoldenEye which is one of the harder Nintendo 64 games to operate. And I can then go on and I've work had it working now, as you can see here um, we're running some PSP games. Um, so this is God of War, which is actually one of the more intensive and harder to run games. And I, I do have to use some frame skipping and it's not absolutely perfect, there's a bit of jittering in it, but you, you could say that that is playable. And again, I'm running on, th on this game Dirt. Um, again, that is a playable game. Um, so PSP is just within reach of this tablet. Beyond that, um, I did try it with GameCube, uh, but that was down to about one or two frames per second, so absolutely no chance of that. But we have now a 
a game console that will play every single game up to PSP uh, and quite a few of the PSP games as well um, in just using a 10 year old tablet and I think that's quite an amazing bit of a resurrection for this device. Now obviously um, when I powered this device on I did a complete clean, I did a factory reset just to make sure that there was nothing in Android that was going to get in the way and slow things down and, and I would recommend that as well just to make sure you're getting optimal performance out of your device. To build up our games console we're going to need two pieces of software. One is an emulator and one is a front end. So the emulator we're going to use is something called RetroArch and if you've been doing any um, retro gaming you'll be aware that this is the one that almost everything uses both on mobile and on your sort of desktop PCs. So RetroArch is a modular uh, emulator in that it allows you to download extra pieces of software which we call cores and each core then adds an extra system that the emulator can uh, emulate. Um, so if, if we want to emulate an NES we will download an NES core and then RetroArch will be able to emulate that system. Now there are a couple of options on how we install this and the easiest way is to go through the Google Play Store uh, and when you log on there, either um, I'm using my computer at the moment for this, um, or if you go through on your actual device, you will either get um, two coming up, so RetroArch Plus and RetroArch in effect Classic, um, or if you are an older machine, you might only get the RetroArch itself. So RetroArch Plus requires Android version 8 and above. Uh, that is the newer version, and it has... Um, just over double the amount of cores built into it than the RetroArch Classic has. So RetroArch Classic will work down to Android version 5, um, but it has, I, I think it's 50 um, different cores built in. But either of these will cover pretty much anything that you want to emulate. It might not have the specific core that you want if you're more into this emulation idea, So, um, but, it, it, but pretty much every system is covered. There is a, a full version of RetroArch, um, but both of these are restricted due to the Google Play um, regulations. But if you want to have a fully unrestricted one where you can choose a very specific core, you need to download the APK package from LibRetro's website. Um, and I will cover that at the end of this video. Um, but for, for, to be honest, pretty much everybody will be fine with either of these that will cover pretty much anything you want to do with your with your device so let's jump on to my huddle here and we will see what's going on so i'm on the play store my huddle is android version 5 so i only have retroarch available to me and to get this all set up i just simply need to install that So once we've got RetroArch installed, we now need to look at our front end. So if we go into our search on the Google Play Store, we want to search for the Dig emulator. So again, um, this is an emulator front end. So if I go into this one, as I say, th this is what provides us the um, user interface to our emulation package. Now there are a number of different front ends that you can use. Uh, one of my favourites is LaunchBox, um, but some of these don't work on the older versions of Android. So, so LaunchBox um, only goes down to version 7 of Android. Um, so Dig um, does go right the way down to version 4, or at least that's as far as I've tested it down to. And it is available directly from the Play Store. So um, we're going to use this one. So simple, all you need to do again is just simply install that and then we can start looking at setting everything up. So that's our two pieces of software now ready to go. But before we can get those set up, we do need to download and put in some of the actual game software for the consoles and computers that we want to emulate. So let's have a look at generating that um, next. So getting hold of some of the actual game software is something which I'm not able to go into in detail on YouTube um, due to the regulations. 
but um, it isn't that the, the, the files aren't that hard to find. And obviously, Google is your best friend when it comes to finding these. If you are having any problems, then do please have a look at uh, my main project page on my website. I'll put a link in the video description down below. And on there, of course, I'm able to give you a bit more help. But we need to get some files um, onto our either tablet or phone, whatever we're using. And, and the easiest way to do that is to put it into its own separate folder. Now, I'm using an SD card here, which I can then, of course, plug into my main PC, assemble all the files, and then just simply plug it in one go into my, my Tesco Huddle ta tablet. Um, if, if you are not able to use SD cards with your device, then obviously you'll have to connect directly into your phone and just simply create the folders in there. But I do suggest that you do create it as its own little separate set of folders because that just keeps everything in one place and makes it easier for you to work out what exactly is going on and, and where things are. So I'm going to create a folder called Retro on my SD card. And inside there, I'm then going to create a, a folder for my BIOS files, a folder for all of my games files. And then as we'll see later on, we can actually um, use things called themes to very much um, personalize the style of the way that our dig front end um, looks. Um, but again, we'll be looking at that a little bit later on. So in, in the BIOS area, um, some of the emulators that you use will need some separate BIOS files. Um, a lot of them won't, um, but some of them do. It, when you come to run a game that does require a BIOS file, the um, RetroArch will tell you. Um, or the easiest way around that is just to simply install a BIOS package. So if you search on Google for RetroArch BIOS package, or if you search for something called a Batacera BIOS package, uh, Batacera is just a different front end, um, that will basically give you a whole set of files. So if I look inside here, you'll see that there is a whole set of files in here. Uh, and this is more than I need for my system, but it just means that I have everything in one go. Now that does take up uh, around about a, a gigabyte of data, so, so do be aware that um, that does of course require an amount of file storage space which you may or may not have available um, to you. But it does then just provide an easy way of getting everything I need just in one go without having to think about it. In inside my games then, I'm just creating a different folder for each of the systems that I'm going to emulate. And inside those then we have the actual files themselves. So again, we have some of our arcade games sitting in here. And really you can put in as many as you want. There is no restriction inside Dig um, other than the actual file space, of course, on whatever you're using to, to store those files. So. We've got everything in place now. So I have my BIOS files, I have my game files. I know which um, machines I'm going to emulate. So I'm gonna emulate Arcade, Mega Drive, and, and so on down this list here. So let's now plug that into our um, tablet or our phone, and we can actually get our games and our emulators all set up. So with my SD card in place, I can now set up RetroArch. So if we open up that application, it will start off by doing a little bit of setting up itself, where it will download some software and just um, reorganize itself slightly. So once that's updated, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to get my BIOS file set up. This is just simply a one-off thing we need to do. Um, if you're not using BIOS files, then just ignore this. But if I go to my settings, so we have a number of different parts of the um, system here. So if I go to settings, and I scroll down on here, so if I just scroll down a bit, we should come to something called directories, uh, eventually down here. So if we go to directory, you can see here, it's tell, we have to tell the system where our BIOS files are. And it defaults, of course, to somewhere inside our Android system. So if I click on that, I can then go out to my storage area. I want to go to my SD card one, I think it is. I've got my retro folder and BIOS, and that's the folder that I want to use. So that's now logged in that BIOS folder as, uh, so if, if, if any of the systems do need some BIOS files, they will look in there. And because I've downloaded a full package, that will of course have everything in place. 
So as I said, that, that is just a one-off um, thing that we need to do when we first set the system up, and that is BIOS now covered. At the moment, RetroArch um, is installed, but it can't emulate anything. So we need to have some cores, and we do that through the online updater. So we have something called a core downloader. And inside here, you'll see there is a, a list of all the cores that this system emulates. And again, there, there's a whole range of systems that we can do in here. Now, as I say, I'm using the RetroArch Classic, so there's about 50 cores in here. And you can see some of those are doubled up. So this, the Amtrad CPC has two different cores in there. When it comes to choosing which core to use, um, to be honest, there isn't a lot of difference in them. I know that a lot of purists will come along and say that there is a lot of difference. And, and yes, when you get down to the very nitty gritty of it, certain cores will either be faster or more accurate, or, or there are various reasons why you would choose one. But if um, you're not familiar with the systems, then really, whatever one you choose will work. If you find it's not working very well for you, then obviously you can try the other one to see if that's any better. But I, I, I wouldn't worry a lot about it at the moment. And all we need to do is to find the cores which we're going to be using for our particular um, emulator. So one of the ones which I had set up on my games folder was um, Arcade. And again, this is one of the more complicated ones where we're, it does use a MAME core. Uh, and MAME does require you to have the right versions of the ROM files for it. Now, I have made a few videos on how to make sure you get that exactly right. Um, so do please have a look at those. So the files that I was using on my when, when I loaded them onto the SD card were from MAME 2003 plus. So I need to get the MAME version that matches up with my particular files. And all we do is to click on that, we can see that it is updating my core or, or installing my core. And once that's in place, now RetroArch is ready to emulate arcade machines. So all I simply need to do now is to go through and find cores for all of the other systems that I want to emulate. So let me do that and then we'll come back in a second. So once you've gone through that process, uh, RetroArch is now ready to emulate our systems. Now, what, what one point while we're here, um, because there are these choices for which core you use, it is important that you make a note of which ones you have actually installed. Because when we come to our front end in, into Dig, and um, we will have to tell it which of the cores we have installed for each particular system. Um, if we tell it the wrong core, then of course it will ask RetroArch to boot up perhaps this core when we haven't installed it. So do make sure you rem remember which ones you've done. So let's go back then to our um, home bit here. And we should then, if we scroll down a bit in here, we should be able to um, quit out of RetroArch, which will save all of our settings and back out to our main um, interface. So it's time now to set up Dig and actually get some of our games up and running. So let's start up our Dig package. And again, that will complete its installation while we're sat here. So just let that run through. And then what we're going to need to do is to tell it where our game files are and then set up um, its connection to RetroArch. So once it's finished its setup, we can see here it's now asking us where our game files are. So if we click on OK for that, we can now tell it where it is. And this is where it was handy to have that all set up in each individual folders. So we can go in through here and we can say which folder we want to scan. So it's going to be on SD card one. It's gonna be in retro. And we put every, all of our games into the games folder. So we simply have to select that games folder. We can then just confirm the whole games folder rather than going into each of the individual files. So if we confirm that, Dig will now scan through all of those folders, find all the games, identify which particular um, consoles and computers those are for, and that should be everything then ready for us. So it looks like it's managed to go through there. So let's now see if we can get some of these set up. So if I click on the um, 
drag in from the side here, we have a menu. So we can go into our systems and you can see it's now identified a number of our systems. And these again are the ones which we set up in, in, our, in our folders. So for each of these then, we now need to make sure that it's connected up to RetroArch correctly. So let's have a look at our Nintendo Entertainment System. So if I select that one, you can see it's picked up games. You'll also see that it has actually downloaded some um, artwork for each of our files or, uh, or each of our games. And it does that automatically through its connection out to one of the file databases. So this is one of the reasons why it's nice to use these front ends. And as you'll see a bit later on, we can then use themes, which will make this whole system just that much more um, interesting. But the way this works then is we are currently looking at a system. So if we go up to our top little menu here, we will be able to configure various settings for this whole system. So when it comes to which emulator we want to use, that again should be for our whole system. So we can go and manage this system. And you can see here that it's telling us that it's going to, by default, use RetroArch and use the Nestopia UE Core. Now, when, when we set things up, again, that's the one that I selected. But if you've selected a different one, if you click on the little selection arrow here, you will see that it now has a whole range of other emulator cores that it knows are relevant to the NES system. Okay, so you simply just need to go through here and pick out the one which is correct for you. So again, we're using RetroArch um, Utopia there. And once we've got that set up, um, we are ready to play a game. So all I need to do is I just simply need to select a game. It will come up with some information about the game. So again, this is all from the games database telling you what's going on. And if we want to play it, we just simply hit the play button and we should get our game starting up. And there we have Legend of Zelda running in a Nintendo Entertainment System console. So once we start up a game, we actually come out of Dig and it actually boots up RetroArch in the background to do the actual emulation. And we can see here that by default RetroArch is set up to put a little overlay over the screen so that we can use our touch screen to press the buttons on the, well, what would have been the game controller. So you've got our D-pad and, and our various buttons over here. At the top, we have some um, buttons then for our, our RetroArch um, control. So in the middle there, we have our RetroArch menu button, which takes us out to, to our main Met RetroArch area. And from here, we can either go back into, after changing various settings and so on, we can go back into our game, or, or indeed we can then of course come back out to here and actually close down our content and exit out of RetroArch. And that will then take us back into our dig console. Um, um, so again, just to ignore the sort of ratings thing. Let me just click on the don't share again bit there. Okay, so that is um, basically our system set up. And as I said, we, we now need to make sure that we have each of the different systems set up. So if I go up to um, my, my menu here, um, you can see that we can start to do various um, other, other things and see various information about this game. But if I go back to my systems menu, Okay, so that will take us back up to all the different bits. So if we want to play a Super Nintendo game, if I go into here, again, I will have to go up to my menu and I will have to go and manage my system and make sure that my default emulator uh, and core is the one I've used. So now that this is not the one that I loaded when I was setting up RetroArch. So if I click on that down arrow, Again, we can see that there are a number of, um, well, th these are RetroArch with various cores that we could use. That you can use um, standalone emulators. So Classic Boy would be a different standalone emulator, so, so outside of RetroArch. But you can see here that we have a number of things that we can, we can set up. Uh, and the one that I loaded in was just a RetroArch um, Oh, 9x version here. So I need to select that to match up with what I loaded into RetroArch. So now if I then click on a game, we should find that that will start up our Super NES emulator. And there we have our Ghosts and Ghouls coming up. And you can see then that we have a different overlay and this matches up with a Super NES controller. 
So that is our basic game setup. And as you can see, we have a number of levels here. So at the moment we're at the individual game level. So our menu in the corner here is various things we can do to manage that individual game. And in effect, we can actually, if we go in here, you can see that if we want to play certain games in, in certain emulator cores, then obviously we can do that from here. So that will then, as I say, override the system settings and then give you individual game settings. We've come out of that. We can then, of course, go back again up to our um, main Super Nintendo settings. So again, the menus up here relate now to the system-wide settings. And then we can go back up again further and have a look at our overall settings. And at this point, we can now start to do overall settings then for the way in which Dig works and various settings on that. But overall, that now gives you a completely working and playable console built with your old phone or tablet. So what I want to do now then is have a look at how we can then further refine this um, with certain aspects of how it works, how it looks, and then how we can control it. So again, the on-screen controls are, are never the greatest ones, so we can actually get around that using some actual physical controllers. So let's have a look at all those things next. So one of the first things I looked at changing when I was doing this was the controller. So I, I, I really don't like the on-screen controllers. I don't, they don't seem to work for me very well. An actual physical controller then, there's a whole range to choose from and it's very much up to you. Now you will need to use one which has a Bluetooth connection as it's, it's a bit awkward on some of these older tablets especially to be able to plug in a USB controller. So both of these then are, are Bluetooth. So we have the standard sort of standalone one and with these then of course you will have your, your phone or whatever um, sitting up somewhere and, and you will then be using this to play on that. The other option then, of course, is to get one of these extendable controllers. Um, so really the phone basically just slips in, in here. And with some of these then, you, you can, on this particular one, it has a little locking device at the back here. So I can actually extend this bit out further um, to accommodate much, much larger devices. And, and this one here allows me then to put my full, um, if I can get my, my tablet in here. So it allows me to put my, my tablet actually in, in here and, and drive that as well. So do make sure you have a look. Um, a lot of the... Um, extendable controllers don't go as wide as this one. A lot of them are designed then for phones um, in, in particular. So, so do make sure you have a look at the specifications. These ones that I'm using here, um, I will put links to the Amazon pages in the descriptions down below. Um, so if you do want to sort of copy what I'm doing, then do please have a look at that. Uh, but very much then, um, these particular ones are quite low price. Um, they're reasonable quality. I wouldn't say they're fantastic quality, but they're reasonable. And again, if you're using this just as a bit of a, a sort of now, now and again type game controller, then, then those are absolutely fine. If you want something more professional, then do have a look around elsewhere. But let's have a look at getting these then set up and plugged into the system. So obviously they are Bluetooth, so you will have to pair them with your devices. I find that with this device, this um, controller here, um, it does offer a number of different Bluetooth modes. Um, that it, it, it calls it direct mode, HID mode, and then it's got the um, switch mode and so on. So this needed to be an Android HID mode for it to work correctly and then allow me to use all of the analog and digital inputs. Um, but again, you'll, you'll need to have a bit of a play around with those, um, but do be aware that that if, if it doesn't work straight off, then that that is perhaps one of the reasons why it's not working. But once we've got it paired up correctly, then we do need to do a little bit of setup inside our um, big software and our RetroArt software. So, so let's go and have a look at that now. So I have my controller plugged in and set up at, as this Android HID device. So to get that set up correctly, I need to go into RetroArch. And, and once we get into there, I need to press a button on my controller and that will cause RetroArch to recognize that it's there. So mine's coming up as an Amazon Fire Game Controller. I'm not entirely sure why it says that, but eventually it will pick it up as the correct device in my Bluetooth settings. But anyway, we, we need to go into our settings screen. So we're using the little cog icon on the side there. And we need to go into the input section because that's where we set up all of our um, controller information. 
So if we come down here, you'll see that there are a, a load of settings to do with our controllers um, and how they're, how they're seen. A lot of these we don't need to worry about for now. But what I want to come down to are the port one controls. So there are, a, you can connect a number of controllers at the same time to your RetroArch, but if we've just got one controller plugged in, it's gonna be coming up as port one. So we need to go in and set the settings for that. So device type then, so my controller is, is actually, I have the analog joysticks on mine as well. So I want to make sure that it's set up as a retro pad with analog. When it comes down to um, analog to digital type, um, we can, if we want, if we don't like using D-pads, we can actually map our analog sticks and use those as D-pad instead. Um, but I'm gonna leave mine just using the D-pad because um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy using those. The device index then, so as, as we have different devices logged into this, we'll get different settings coming up here. So at the moment it's thinking that my controller is this Amazon Fire game controller. Um, it, it will sort things out later on once it sort of updates itself. The main thing we want to do in here though is that we want to um, map our controls. So it will have a reasonable stab at them, but it won't have grabbed all of our controls correctly. So the easiest way to do that is to go through the set all controls option. And once we do this, it will ask us to hold down various buttons and controls, and it will then look at what we've pressed and map those in. So let me go through that process. So I'm gonna click on set all controls. It's asking me to hold down my B button, which is the down button. Then I Y button, which is left and so on. So I really just need to go through, I'm holding them in until it recognizes them correctly. Okay, so that's all of our control setup. We now need to go down and save that controller profile. And at this point I can actually use the controls on my controller. So I want to save that controller profile and I want to then just click on that. So that's my controller profile now set up. So let's go and see if that's working in our game. So we're going to come out of RetroArch and then boot up into our game. So I'm gonna go into a Super Nintendo game, so Super Ghouls and Ghosts, if I play into that. I still have my on-screen controls and we're gonna sort that out in a little bit. And let me just get the volume down here so we don't have to worry about that. But I should now have my buttons working. So if I press my start button, it should get me through these screens. Again, you can see it's now recognized my controller as the proper controller, but all of my buttons now will work. So if I can start the game. So we're into the game, and of course we can now use our controller rather than having to rely on those on-screen controls. So there we go. And we've got all of our controls working. Again, and do, I do apologize for this lag in the screen here. That's because I'm actually running my Android monitoring through a USB connection, which actually slows the whole system down a bit. Um, but, but there we go. So we've got our controller now working. Now, one of the issues we do now have is that although we're using our controller, we still have the on-screen display, and that does get in the way of our gaming. So let's have a look at how we can get rid of that. And also then, we at the moment we have to hit through the menu buttons and so on to get out of our game, so we can both get rid of our overlay and then add some what are known as hotkeys to get us directly out of our game just using our controller buttons. So let's quit out of our game here and come back out into dig. So the settings we're gonna make are at the system level um, in dig. So we need to come back out of our game and up to our Super Nintendo settings. And what we'll find here is when we try to use hotkeys and play with the overlays, Dig can actually get in the way. So if we come up into our system settings here, when we go to manage system, there is something on the bottom here which is our retro arch overlay. And what, what happens here is that we can select what overlay we want retro arch to use when we're playing the system. So if I scroll down here, you'll see that by, by default, um, Dig is set to use 
the SNES overlay. And of course that makes sense because that has all the proper SNES buttons. But when we come to use our gamepad and our, our hotkeys, that's actually going to get in the way. And what I found, um, we need to set our overlay to default overlay. And at that point, um, Dig will not get in the way and it will just let RetroArch set things up for itself. And at that point, RetroArch's um, hotkeys, because we're, we're going to set all the hotkeys inside RetroArch, they will then work. So we do make sure, need to make sure that for every system that we have, we have changed its overlay to default, and that will then mean that we can rely on our controller and RetroArch sorting things out. Obviously, that just gives us a, a default overlay, which is generally um, RetroArch will use a sensible one as well. Um, but if you do prefer to use your on-screen controls, then obviously leave these as the um, dig versions, because they will give you much closer to the original console. So let's OK that. We now need to go into um, RetroArch. So we'll come, come out of Dig and we're going to go into RetroArch. Again, I'm going to press a control on my controller so that RetroArch recognises it's there. And again, it's picking it up as the correct version now. We want to go into our settings and then coming down here, we want to go to our on-screen display and our on-screen overlay. And here, we want to tick the box that says hide overlay when our controller is connected. So basically, it will, it will put the overlay up, but as soon as it detects a button press on one of our controllers, it will hide the overlay so that we can just play at them with our controller. So let's come back out of that. We now need to go back to our settings, and we're going to go into our input, and we're going to come down till we get to our hotkeys. So we're going to go into hotkeys, and the only two that we need to play with here are the menu toggle and the quit. So, so menu toggle will allow us to open up the RetroArch menu, which lets us then do various setups and, and so on and saving games and, and things like that. And obviously then the quit controller, that will actually quit RetroArch directly from our game and take us straight back into Dig so that we can select another game. So if we click on um, one of these, it gives us a series of options of which button combinations are going to trigger this action. So for menu toggle, I tend to set that to be my L2 and R2 to my two shoulder buttons. If I press them in together, then that will bring up the menu. My quick controller then, I tend to set that to L3 and R3. So those are the two thumb switches when you press down on your analog joysticks. And I'm going to use that then as my quit controller button. Now we need to make sure that we save these settings, so we do that by going into the home menu and then actually quitting through RetroArch through this button here. And once RetroArch quits, it, um, by default it will save your settings. So if I click on that, that should now have saved my settings. So now if I go back into Dig and I go into my game and run that up, Once I'm in my game now, you can see that I've now got the default um, overlay. So it's just like a generic overlay, which has got all the buttons that um, any controller would have. I can now, as soon as I hit a button on my controller, it will recognize I've got a controller plugged in and we should then lose that overlay. And there we go, we've got a nice clean display now. So I should be able to hit my two shoulder buttons and that brings up my menu. Click them again, and that puts that away. And now if I press my two thumb switches, that should take me out of the game and back into Dig. So we've now got full control of our game, going into the game, playing the game, coming back out of the game, all now set up on our controller. And it gets rid of that overlay that gets in the way as we're playing. So that's all of our gameplay sorted out. Really the last thing that I want to take you through then is making everything look a bit better. And we do that using things called themes. So at the moment we've got our main sort of home page, um, which just lists the various sections that we can go into. And if we go into our system section, you can see we then have a grid of some um, little icons for our different um, consoles. And then we go down into our games and, and so on. But we can make all of this look a lot better and a lot more fun to play with um, by using a theme. 
So we get to our themes through, if we go back to our home menu, we get to that through our options button down the bottom here. So again, our options let us do a number of things um, <clears throat> in sort of the housekeeping of our set dig setup. Uh, one of those, of course, is ROM scanning. So if we do want to download some more games or anything, we simply have to download the game files. But we then need to come in here and then tell it where to look and then do a manual scan or, or, or whatever to, to actually get it to read those um, ROMs and log them into our game directory. As well, you've seen that we were downloading various covers for our games, various images. Again, if, if any of those are missing, we can start to refresh our images and go through that process. But the last thing we want to do then is manage our themes. Now, there are a number of ready-made themes that we can install onto Dig. Um, you can make your own, of course, but it is it is quite a big job. Um, so um, I, I would tend to stick with the ready-made ones. Now there is a Browse Themes button here, which generally does work, but again, I'm working on a very old system, so, so that button um, just doesn't seem to do anything for me at the moment. Um, so I'm going to show you, um, usually the Browse Themes will take you out, you can have a look at previews of the themes, there'll be a download button, um, and that should then download it, and you can then tell it to install the theme, and that would usually be from your Downloads folder. But I'm going to use my PC in this instance. So I'm going to take my SD card, I'm going to download some themes onto that and then install them from there. So you'll need to go to the digdroid.com slash forums web page. And on there you'll find a link to the themes page. So if we go out to that one, you'll see a range of themes listed and we can simply click on any one that we want. And that will take us to a preview of that theme, so we can see what it's going to look like. And then down the bottom here, you can see that we have some download links. So all I need to do is to download these theme files. They come down as zip files, put them onto my SD card, um, or as I said, download, download them straight onto your device. And then we're going to use that options menu to load that theme into our dig installation. So I'm back in my options and themes menu in Dig. I just go to install theme. It's on my SD card in retro in themes. And I'm going to install the retrofied reunified light one. I confirm that. So that will now be installed and it will take a little bit of time. So I'll, I'll let that run. So once that's been fully extracted, in my select theme, if I drop that down, you should find our new theme sitting in there. And if I select that, that then should change the whole look of our dig insulation. So we've now got our home page. Instead of that simple list, we can now see that we can scroll across here by dragging and we've got all of our options here. So if I come back across, we can go into our systems we now have a much nicer control then for our, our systems. So we got our arcade games, our Nintendo 64 games, and we get nice background art. If we go into our Nintendo Entertainment System, you can see we now have a better um, set of scrolling um, options for our game display. So it's pretty much our retro gaming console, fully complete and ready to play. So for pretty much no outlay, the game um, controller was really the only thing that we would need to buy. We've turned our obsolete mobile phone or tablet into a really great little mobile gaming device. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, if you have, do please hit that like and subscribe button. Every time you do that, it really does help build the channel. So all that's left now is to get that old device out of your drawer and build one for yourself. So, bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.